Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. Okay. Hello, everyone. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So uh, I'm a, a well. My name, you know. I'm a um, co-founder and a consultant at a company called DevOps. This is the DevOps track, so it probably fits. Uh, what we're going to talk about? Uh, a little bit of background. The background includes new stuff happening in the architecture. Um, the containers thing that everybody's talking about, and uh, the main uh, topic of the gr of the talk is uh, schedulers and uh, running containers and schedulers, and the various kinds of schedulers and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Even though it's called grids, I'll explain at the end uh, where that com comes from. So, most of you, I'm guessing, are uh, involved in some kind of uh, software as a service application. Anyone? Everybody, right? And uh, software as a service applications, they live on the web and they have an uh, architecture that looks kind of like this. Uh, all kinds of parts usually run in the cloud, even though it doesn't have to be. And uh, there are various sizes that this can go. So you can start with a small startup, maybe with this two-layer um, architecture, but eventually you end up with more and more and more and more servers, and they grow in the, and shrink elastically. This is the, the orange line. And it becomes more and more challenging to manage all of this, especially uh, for people that, uh, until several years ago, used to manage servers manually. Hopefully, nobody is doing that uh, today. And this is how a data center of Google uh, looks like. So basically, when you get this, these nice Amazon servers, there are actual servers behind those. And uh, somebody man manages all that. And when you ask for a box, there is software that decides where that box will be running at. Right? Uh, all. I assume you, you agree. If you don't, then please uh, tell me so. And of course, it's not humans who decide where that runs, it's software. And basically, this is a big compute cluster. The software is, well, it's hard to pinpoint the definition, but this is what grids are about. So grids is the software that is isolating the stuff that runs on the hardware from the hardware itself. And they have been around for a long, long time. I mean, just Google is already uh, how old is Google? More than 10 years, right? And uh, they started with this from the beginning, so they already had lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, servers uh, once they moved out of Stanford with their, Stanford with their couple of uh, boxes. And uh, today, in 2016, everybody is talking about um, microservices. Everybody is saying, well, we are running microservices, right? or we want to move to our monolithic application to microservices. Uh, when people say microservices, they say microservice architecture. This is a kind of architecture of software that says that various parts um, are not coupled between themselves. So the software is not, the different parts of the software are not coupled. And they don't care about where they run, right? The, they have minimal knowledge of their environment. And uh, loosely coupled also means that you can update any of the parts without touching any of the other ones. And taking this and the amount of hardware and instances and elasticity and the cloud and everything makes it impossible to manage uh, for humans. Uh, this is an example of microservices. You might think, well, microservices is just the side that is part of my application, but actually it's also the side that is like infrastructure, uh, the operational side, where is the configuration stored, 
how do you access your data, the, the queue. Uh, we heard you talk about Rabbit and queue before. Is that a service? Yes, it's a service. Uh, does it need to be managed? In and there are no batteries? Please fix this. Uh, yes. Okay. <coughs> Okay. This is uh, this is an example of all the various microservices and how they talk to each other. From a slide I stole from Adrian Cockroft from Netflix. I don't remember if this is like up to date. I am guessing not. It's probably a couple of years old, but. They, they already had all of these microservices, and uh, they had to be managed somehow automatically, and most of you probably heard about Netflix. It's one of the exemplary companies in the, in the DevOps movement about how they are doing things. So to cap it up, uh, way back in like many years ago, 20 years ago, we had this big spaghetti-oriented architecture. Then we had a monolith that is layered, and uh, now we're talking about microservices. And uh, the famous quote from Jeff Bezos from Amazon that <coughs> Amazon is building their company in such a way that uh, each team that is responsible for a service is small enough to be fed by two pizzas. And uh, if you know uh, the term Conway's Law, Conway's Law says that the architecture of your software uh, will be mimicking the organization ar um, hierarchy of your organization. So uh, once we have understood the change happening to architecture, to software architecture, let's talk about containers. Anybody who heard about Docker and containers? Everyone. Great. I will not be talking about Docker. Uh, what is Docker? It's basically some kind of a host, right? Uh, usually Linux. And there's an API, and you say to this API, run containers on it, and it puts these boxes on top of the whale. <coughs> uh, OK, and now uh, once you have this on your laptop, you're saying, OK, cool, I rule the world. Docker, everybody, everything is working. But then you have lots and lots of whales. You have like Google amount of whales. and. Uh, how do you run, how do you put boxes on top of these whales? So you use some kind of a software that has an API, you tell it to put whales, and it puts it, puts it there. But there are many, many of such softwares or services. So I, I will be talking mostly about Mesos, but uh, there are many others. Also, once all these boxes are sitting on top of all the whales, or your application microservices are running on all, all of the uh, microservices are running on all of the hosts, they need to kind of find each other in some kind of way, right? So there's this whole service discovery thing, which also has lots and lots and lots of options. This is just four of them. And then the infrastructure where these whales are actually living, the, the sea they live in, it can be Amazon or it can be Google or whatever, or it can be your uh, Bezek Ben Lumi uh, data center, which falls on its face every Monday. <clears throat> so this is where the software comes from. This is where these grid uh, grids are placed. This is the context. One of uh, the schedulers is called uh, Mesos. It's an Apache uh, project from 2009, so it's not new. It uh, just got more popular recently because of uh, the various things that were written using Mesos. And uh, it, it can do all kind of very cool stuff, like it can manage things that run on 10,000 whales. So imagine a sea of 10,000 whales, and you need to give them, like, I don't know, GPS tracking chips. Mesos can do it for you. 
Um, and actually, we're going to talk about Kubernetes later, but Kubernetes can, you can run on top of Mesos, and they, kinda, they are kind of friends. They're not an enemies. So how does uh, Mesos work? There's uh, this uh, uh, cluster of Mesos masters, uh, which also have zookeepers, because they kind of need to keep their zoo together, their data. And then various frameworks. It doesn't matter which framework. For example, a framework that creates HDFS. Uh, the framework asks the Mesos cluster, please give me uh, some whales to put my HDFS on. And uh, there would be uh, an offer to the framework uh, of some of the 10,000 uh, machines. And, uh, and there would be run, uh, and eventually an executor would execute the task, like install HDFS or whatever. And many different frameworks can be used. So Mesos is what is called a general purpose uh, grid, or uh, because it doesn't actually care about the frameworks. It's completely decoupled from them. It, you can run any kind of frameworks. You want to run Ruby on Rails applications, you can do that. You want to run stuff on Windows, you can do that. Now, we talked briefly about uh, Docker, and uh, the slide that is usually shown with Docker is that, okay, we had virtual machines before, and all that complexity, the guest to s blah, 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 and now we have Docker, it's much better. But still, you're talking about host and servers. But what is actually running this application on uh, 10,000 hosts? You need something different, something like Mesos. You talk to Mesos, you tell it to run applications, and it doesn't matter how many hosts you have, Mesos will do the job. And uh, lots of companies that have lots and lots of clients, they make lots and lots of money, are using Mesos to manage their infrastructure because they don't have the, the people to do it manually because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and uh, one of the guys, I don't actually remember his name, who was involved with Mesos, he went to work for Twitter, he made some kind of really cool stuff of adopting Mesos there, then he went to Airbnb, and he did his magic there, and now he started a company called Mesosphere, and they um, maintain some of the frameworks that uh, are used in Mesos, and they also contribute a lot to, to Mesos. Some other companies that are not very apparent that are using Mesos, for example, NVIDIA, uh, are using Mesos to kind of manage lots and lots and lots of hosts that have GPUs on them and run tasks uh, in different ways on, on these hosts. They have this blog post about this. And uh, another surprising company is uh, Microsoft with Windows Server. So Mesos is not constrained to Linux unlike Docker at the moment. And it can actually run any kind of tasks on any kind of operating system, because it's just a stupid scheduler. Now, uh, but let, let's go back to containers, because we started with containers. <coughs> so in the Mesos, one of the frameworks of Mesos is Marathon. Marathon is maintained by Mesosphere. And what it does, it creates Docker containers in the Mesos grid cluster, or grid or cluster. Uh, what features does it have? So, it, Marathon itself needs to have schedulers that you talk to and you tell them, well, run a, an application, right? And these schedulers are highly available, so there's more than one, basically. Um, Marathon supports constraints, so you can say, this application, I need to run it like five times, but it should never be on the same physical host. It should be always on five different hosts. These are the kind of constraints you might want to ask it to do. Or uh, you, you can ask it like, these two um, containers should always be on the same host together. Or you can tell it this container should be limited to the amount of memory or CPU um, that it, it receives from the host. Um, Marathon also includes internal service discovery via DNS and via subscribing to an, it used to be HA proxy, I'm not sure what it is now, uh, subscribing the newly formed 
uh, boxes, the containers, to, to a load balancer. It also supports checking the health of all the boxes and doing things uh, according to the health, like restarting them or starting new ones. Um, you can, via API, subscribe to all the events that Marathon is doing, like it created more boxes or it removed some boxes. You can get notifications and uh, with a different service in your microservice architecture, uh, trigger some kind of action upon those events. And it has this nice graphical UI and uh, the API, of course, metrics and uh, it can collect, collect logs from all the 10,000 servers and show them to you and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it's open source, even though it's uh, maintained by Mesosphere. Another similar uh, thing is uh, the Amazon Elastic Compute Service, or ECS. It also runs containers, uh, Docker, mostly. Uh, also, if I didn't say, Mar Marathon can run Docker, but it can also run any other kind of uh, application, either Windows applications, a Ruby on Rails application without Docker, without containers. It can just execute those as well. But containers are nice, uh, so if you're running like Python or, or Ruby applications, just put them in the container anyway. So um, Amazon, if you're using Amazon already, you're already familiar with their APIs. You know the, the structure of the command line and whatever, and um, the Elastic Container Service is doing something similar, but coupled to Amazon. So you cannot actually use it outside of Amazon. They did give a, a local, local development support, like you run ECS commands, but it actually uses Docker Compose in the background. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can run the ECS agent. It can manage hosts that are located in different kind of places, like Google even. But the, the masters are always in Amazon, and they're closed source, okay? And if they are misbehaving, it's basically a support call to Amazon. You cannot do anything about it. Um, it can uh, use, it has its own scheduler, so basically it decides by its own where, where to run the things, but it can also use a custom scheduler, for example, Mesos. It can use Mesos behind the scenes to decide where to put the containers. Uh, another popular thing that runs Dockers is uh, Kubernetes by Google. It's uh, something that Google wrote in open source based on the internal systems they have uh, called the uh, Borg. And uh, it has all these uh, long lists of terminology you need to use, so it looks a bit daunting. It, like, it's, it has a, a learning curve. You need to learn how to talk about it. But once you grasp that, it's pretty simple, and it has lots and lots and lots of features that are not available el elsewhere. So, uh, well, actually, self-healing is available in the marathon, as far as I know. But basically, when a host fails, uh, all the containers running on the host Kubernetes can bring those containers up again somewhere else. Also, if a container fails uh, in some unpredictable manner, Kubernetes can bring up a replacement container, either on the same place or somewhere else. It can uh, start containers in a group that is kind of um, related to each other. If you have several containers related to each other, it's called a pod. It can start those as groups. And it has uh, service discovery and load balancing. So basically, any kind of uh, container in the Kubernetes cluster can ask a Kubernetes API, where is the, I don't know, database, and Kubernetes will kind of know where that is and tell it. Um, and the amount of features is growing with every re release. They actually, uh, several days ago, they released uh, version 1.2 and it has a gazillion new features that I don't even know about. So uh, if you're looking for a way to run Docker um, with lots and lots of features, lots and lots of ways that you can control the process, Kubernetes is an uh, open source 
um, tool that can enable you to do that. And if you're using Google Cloud, they have a managed Kubernetes. It's called Google Container Service Engine. Yeah, Google Container Engine, which is basically Kubernetes uh, behind the scenes. But you don't need to install it itself, yourself. Uh, another nice feature is uh, bin packing. What is bin packing is when you have lots and lots of whales, you don't you want to put your containers on as few whales as possible, so you can release the other whales and not pay for them, right? Uh, and this is bin packing. It will try to like optimize the way it creates new uh, boxes so they fit into as few whales as possible. And you can uh, release all the other whales to the wild uh, and not pay for them. <laughs> yes, free will. Um, another notable way to run many, many containers and many, many hosts is uh, by Docker themselves. Docker has have released Docker Swarm and they're pushing very hard to market that. Basically, it's uh, the nice thing about it is that it uses the same API as Docker. So if you are talking to one Docker host, you can talk to something that looks like a Docker host, but is actually 10,000 hosts behind the, the API. And it also supports all the Docker features like the new pluggable networking and pluggable volumes in the best way possible among all the other options. Um, they have show, they, they are trying to push the limit as much as they can. So uh, at the moment, I mean, this could be not very up to date, but they're talking about running 1,000 hosts and running 50,000 containers on those, and it runs smoothly. And um, you can plug in your own scheduler, for example, Mesos. And you can plug in your own host discovery, for example, Amazon Auto Scaling Group or whatever. And of course, there are more features I'm not talking about. And another option, which has lots of features because I actually grabbed Seth earlier and I asked him to elaborate. So uh, HashiCorp has its own kind of scheduler slash service that runs containers called Nomad. And uh, Nomad has this uh, notion of uh, pods or like in Docker Compose called task groups. So basically you can run several containers together. Uh, it is using console for service discovery. It's uh, of course tightly in, uh, integrated with the other HashiCorp uh, tools like console. And this is a good thing. Um, and regarding containers, I didn't know this, but it can not just run Docker containers. It can also execute VMs. It can also create VMs. And it can, like a marathon, it can also run just simple um, single binary applications like a jar or Go a compiled application. And it can run these applications on Windows as, as well. OK? So uh, the, the or virtual machines here is like, like OpenStack, basically. It comes to replace OpenStack. Uh, it has several ways to run co uh, containers. Run everywhere just means this container should be everywhere. For example, your Kubernetes agent. Uh, a batch is, this is the job that needs to be done. Run these containers. When they're over, they're over, and uh, that's it. A service is like a daemon. I need this container to be multiple time, uh, five times to always be there. And um, a cron is run this every hour, every five minutes. And this is similar to Kronos, another uh, Mesosphere, uh, sorry, Mesos framework. Um, the constraints we already talked about, you can decide to run things together, to run things apart, to constrain the memory or the CPU or whatever. And uh, it can uh, support because, because of it rides on top of console. So basically, if you have multiple data centers or multiple regions in Amazon, you can have one nomad to rule it all. And you can even have continental partitions. So if you have your Amazon Frankfurt and uh, Ireland, 
on one hand, you would call that nomad Europe, and on the other hand, you have like the USA, uh, all the regions there, you would call that nomad USA. You can um, connect these two um, grids together and basically see the, the view from one place. This is a superset of, of console. So console already gives you that, but this is something um, like bigger. Ah, um, the, the biggest problem with Kubernetes and Mesos and Marathon and all of that is that it's bloody hell hard to install. It takes a day to install that, that stuff. Uh, it's, it's not very friendly for, for operations people. And uh, like all other recent HashiCorp products, this one is written in Go, so it's basically one binary. It's also the, the CLI, it's the daemon, it's everything. You just run this one binary in your Windows, in your Linux, and you're done. You have your Nomad working. Um, and it doesn't use Zookeeper, which all the others do use. Uh, well, Swarm also doesn't use Zookeeper. But Kubernetes and, uh, and Marathon, they, uh, or Mesos more uh, correctly, they need to have a Zookeeper cluster. And the Zookeeper cluster is in itself a pain to install and manage. Um, and you can have service discovery either with console or with anything else, which is pluggable. And it has this uh, self-healing stuff, and it has the bean packing stuff. And as I mentioned already, you can run tasks on Windows as well. So Windows, uh, like the Windows whales, can be part of your um, of your whales group, I guess. And uh, and there's a there's a nice chart that Seth uh, explained to me, and he created it, but. It just explains how it works, and I would not go into that at the moment. Okay, so um, basically, grids are the way to separate, to uh, decouple your hardware from the applications running on that hardware. This is, I don't know, Raspberry Pis or something, and it's running a Mesos cluster. Uh, uh, sorry, not the Mesos, it's actually running a Hadoop cluster on, on Yarn, a different kind of grid. But the person running the Hadoop cluster, does it care about each one of the, the raspberries? No, it doesn't care about them. They're like, you can replace them, you can add more of them, you can remove some of them, and the cluster will still operate and still work. Unlike traditional monolithic applications where you had your one or maybe two servers for high availability, uh, and when you removed one of them, you actually had a service disruption. And uh, this is how a Google data center looks like. And uh, because I'm bored, I watched a Gartner webinar some months ago, and um, they were talking about total cost of ownership of servers. And when you're thinking about servers and data centers, the, the co total cost of ownership of that can be like a couple of thousand dollars per month uh, after you bought it. But in Google, uh, what they do is when a server is malfunctioning, they just throw it away. They just do the bin with you and they recycle it. And that saves them time of having maintenance personnel maintaining the servers uh, and it reduces the cost of managing a huge amount of hardware because actually they don't care about the hardware. They don't have uh, names for each one of the whales here. You see lots and lots and lots of whales. None of them have names. If one of them is sick, uh, I'm sorry, they just kill it and throw it away. And uh, th these are uh, some pictures of the like older kinds of grids. So these are some German uh, academics running a Linux cluster on a bunch of uh, servers. And this is somebody at home who built a Beowulf cluster, which, uh, sorry, Beowulf grid. This is the comeback of grid, grids. And this has been done a long time ago, but today, since we're all using cloud, we don't actually uh, are used to seeing hardware anymore other than our laptops. 
so this is done by somebody else. And it costs on uh, maintenance. Of You don't need the people who go and check all the cables and everything. There's software that sees, well, some kind of cable disattached. This host is no longer functioning. I will throw it away from my list, and I will no longer run any kind of uh, tasks on it. 